and I'm very excited to be moderating today's discussion on the title of our program, which is Never Surrender or Retreat, Texas versus Washington, D.C. in Law and Litigation. And what I'd like to do is first introduce and bring up our panelists and then uh, introduce the topic further. So the first thing that I would like to do is introduce the, our Texas Attorney General, Ken Paxton. General Paxton. He's elected as the 51st Attorney General for the state of Texas. He's been married to his wife, Angela, for 31 years, I believe. Uh, they have four children, Tucker, Abby, Maddie, and Katie. Uh, prior to that, he had a distinguished service in the state senate and also the state house. And I think in looking at the last two years for General Paxton, his signature achievement, one of them, has been the way that he has led Texas as Texas has led other states in these multi-coalition state efforts in not only fighting the past administration, but also in working with the current administration. So help me in welcoming General Paxton. Also, it's a, a great joy and privilege of mine to introduce our other panelists, and that is our Texas Land uh, Commissioner, George P. Bush. Commissioner Bush was elected to the Texas General Land Office as its commissioner in 2014. He's married to Amanda Bush, and they have two sons. And to highlight a signature achievement of his tenure in office so far is the way that his office has increased the revenue that the General Land Office has been generating in the managing investments that benefit public education for Texas. And all of this doing at the same time as decreasing the size of the General Land Office, both of those being great accomplishments. Help me in welcoming Commissioner Bush. So gentlemen, both of you welcome. Thank you for being here today. Glad to be here. We are uh, thrilled to have this discussion and the way that we're going to frame this is a short look in the past as a way of looking into the future. And the way I want to frame that is by talking about a piece of litigation that I had the, the privilege and honor to work both with General Paxton and Commissioner Bush in defending the sovereignty of Texas and standing up for its citizens. And that was a case that we had uh, that involved the Red River of Texas. And to, to set it up briefly, what you had was a situation in 2009 where the, the Bureau of Land Management uh, decided for itself that its territories in Oklahoma overlapped into Texas and just declared that approximately 90,000 acres of private property in Texas along a 116-mile stretch of the Red River uh, along the counties of Wichita and Clay and Wilbarger just belonged to the federal government. It's interesting to note historically that going all the way back to when Texas became a nation, the south bank of the Red River has always been the boundary for political and private property rights. And what happened was that BLM surveyors actually came south of the river, in some ways trespassing, and put federal markers in the ground approximately a mile or two miles away from the river flowed, not only claiming that as federal lands, but actually claiming that as the boundary for uh, the state of Texas. And to kind of introduce this case, we're going to show a short video uh, and then talk about what the win of the case, because we won at the end of last year, working together, uh, what that means for Texas. I'll show you down below the hill, you'll see how special it is. It's just a wonderful, beautiful place that we love. Just growing up as a kid and, and work with my granddad and my grandmother, Thanksgivings and Christmas when all the family was here, and this was, this was the property that we all gathered. And it's just a quiet, peaceful, serene place to go. And we just, that's, we enjoy that place. I've uh, worked all my life to have this opportunity to own land in Texas, 
something I could possibly pass on to my grandchildren and my children. If they're going to do this to us, what are they going to do to y'all? Farmers and ranchers are going to test field plants. Where's it going next? When's this all going to stop? This, this is private property with deeded titles from the state of Texas, and we don't see that it should be in dispute. If it actually happened, I mean, we would keep going, but it would definitely shake my <laughs> belief in what this country stands for. So briefly what happened, in 2015, our litigation center at the foundation represented a coalition of landowners. We filed suit against the Bureau of Land Management, and then what was amazing about this effort was immediately the Texas Attorney General's office, General Paxton, jumps into the case, files suit on behalf of Texas, and then Commissioner Bush and the General Land Office comes in, files suit on behalf of the GLO, and all of us together push back. And uh, to start off with, I guess, General Paxton, Thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of this effort. And tell me why you chose to get involved in this case. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me. This is, as I look around the room, I'm, I, I don't think Texas would be Texas uh, but for the people in this room. And the difference that you all make, I mean, I just sitting right in front of me, you've got Ernest Angelo, Dick Salisbury, and Bill Holmes, just three examples of people that have had a tremendous impact on Texas. And so I don't know if you realize how important you are, not just to Texas, but to really the survival of our country, the survival of our Constitution. And this case is a perfect example of, of TPPF stepping into a fight that was not just about a few landowners. It was about our Constitution. It was about separation of powers. It was about this idea of whether the federal government could just really ruin what our, what our founders so deeply cared about, which was this idea that there really was a separation of powers that we didn't want one person making decisions for us. And having the efforts and the resources of TPPF allowed us to step into the case because we couldn't step into the case until there was some harm. And these landowners had a more immediate harm. And by TPPF stepping in, it allowed us to intervene in the case and then protect the, the rights of Texas as it related to our, our, our ability to collect taxes that we'd always collected. So, this is just another great example of, of TPPF making a, a really huge difference, really not just for Texas, but for the entire nation. Well, thank you. Commissioner Bush, your viewpoint on this. Uh, please tell us how, how you directed your agency to, to jump in this fight. Well, honestly, I first heard about the story from Tommy Henderson, who was a, a rancher in the vicinity of the Red River, who in 1984 had to cede title to his ranch that he owned through multiple generations was timely in his tax payments um, for over 100 years. But because he couldn't afford the litigation costs to take on the big bad uh, federal government, had to cede, um, cede ownership. And in 2014, when I first ran for office, I had a chance to meet him in, in Walburger County. And he told me that the BLM was offering the, him the ability to buy his land back. Um, and. No, it's, it's uh, actually the contrary. It's a shame that the federal government took, and the federal government, because it has more resources than a private landowner, essentially took a private landowner's um, asset, um, and he had to um, buy it back. And so I knew that if I was privileged to serve you in this, in this position, that um, I didn't want this to happen on our watch. Um, BLM, um, as Rob had alluded to in 09, uh, published a, a survey that once again, took a different opinion of the 1923 Texas versus Oklahoma case that said that the boundary between the federal government and the state of Texas was static. What that interpretation resulted in was, as Rob alluded to, a 90,000 acres of taking in a redefinition of who actually owns title along the Red River. Um, so along with the general, along with the Center for America's Future, 
And being a fiduciary to the school children of the great state of Texas, we intervened uh, in the case. Um, to me, uh, as the general alluded to, you think about the Jeffersonian principles of life, liberty, and happiness. Happiness is synonymously interpreted as property in, in colonial times. And property is truly the foundation of what makes our country great. The, the fundamental idea that we are not subject to a monarch or to nobility, that we can derive our own income and derive our own happiness from our own, um, from our own position and our own stake. So um, I'm, I'm, I was just delighted and thrilled to be a part of this, and I think that there are opportunities to partner like this in the future. General Paxton, to one aspect of this case was being asked about the greater significance after we won, uh, but also in the perception that once President Trump came into office, it was all over. Uh, but as you know, we had to continue to litigate it all the way up to trial, uh, even into the first year of the administration. We're talking about the deep state. We're talking about the bureaucrats that still remain. And what do you think are the lessons of this case moving forward for Texas and for your office? So I, I really can't understate the impact of, of having Donald Trump as president because of Neil Gorsuch and the difference that that is going to make in all of these cases. I had, we had 27 lawsuits that we filed in 27 months against the Obama administration and we were successful almost without exception. We, we were winning these cases in the courts even though we were having to deal with liberal courts along the way. But when we got to the Supreme Court and we had our immigration case, it was the first big case that the states got to the Supreme Court and we had, we had lost Scalia. So obviously that made us nervous because we knew that was a vote in, in our favor. And we ultimately ended up with a 4-4 tie. This was 26 states suing over a policy that, that the president had made up about immigration. And we had four judges tell us that, that you know, yeah, the president is allowed to just make up the law. So even though we've been successful, first of all, the election was critical to our survival because I am convinced that had we lost that election and we had another Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that this whole idea of separation of powers and federalism, cooperative federalism, where the states retained the power not specifically granted to the federal government, that was over. We were done. We were, we, we were post-constitutional America. And so first, winning the election was huge, but the battle really is not over. As you know, we still had all these cases going on, and he had this time period where he was bringing in his own people and getting them to focus on the issues that we really cared about sometimes took some work, and this was one of those, one of those cases. And we had many other cases just like that. But you can definitely see, as he's been in longer and longer, greater degree of cooperation, more of these cases being resolved, and now more cooperation with them in dealing with what the other side is now doing, which is going to liberal judges and asking them to change what a duly elected legislature has done. And so now that's the, the new battle is away from uh, a, a basically an executive changing law. Now they're going to the Ninth Circuit. They're going to liberal judges in Washington State. They're going to liberal judges in San Antonio and saying, let's just change the law, and then we have to go fight that battle. It's the same battle, it's just a different battlefield. Commissioner Bush, uh, General Paxson had mentioned the state tax revenue as being one of the state interests, but I found it very interesting in this case how not just the property rights of our clients, but specific responsibilities of your office were threatened by the Bureau of Land Management overreach. Would you explain how this case impacted what, what y'all do? Absolutely. Well, a little known fact is that you own 13 million acres of surface rights and mineral rights that are constitutionally protected and that generate uh, one of the largest sources of revenue for K through 12 and post-secondary ed uh, here in Texas. So I serve along with uh, a, a, an appointee from the governor's office and from the attorney general's office where we administer this, this awesome portfolio. What makes Texas unique is that we actually own over 10% of our state's geography. Uh, unlike my friends in the Western States Land Commissioners Association, less than 1% of our geography is controlled by the feds. Um, it's a great gift that Sam Houston and the forefathers gave um, the, the, the children and the grandchildren of Texas. So I have to be a fiduciary to the school children. And sometimes that means going to the courthouse. Um, that's not in our specific um, responsibility, but we felt that since we had legal standing, and I have to credit Mark Havens, who's um, my general counsel and now deputy land commissioner, 
in helping assess our standing and, and our uh, positioning in the case, but it gave us a chance to participate um, and to work with uh, your group, Rob, to make sure that we were standing up for private and um, public landowners that were going to be impacted by this dangerous precedent that infringes upon uh, the Tenth Amendment. Well, that's a great segue, uh, Commissioner Bush, in wanting to use um, the look back that we had at our win in the Red River case as an opportunity to look forward. And we have a new administration, we have a new president, and you know, I wanted to ask you, you know, how you see that things are different, but specifically, as you alluded to the Tenth Amendment and federalism, where you see that we are today as compared to where we were when we were fight, fighting that case? Well, certainly I'm encouraged by the judicial nominations. I think that is going to be the hallmark of the Trump presidency is the fact that we are nominating a new generation of, of young conservatives that are originalists in their thinking and that are strict uh, constitutionalists. Uh, that's a legacy that goes beyond um, just a matter of a political uh, cycle. But I, I think you all alluded to this. My, my number two actually um, was poached by the Trump administration to be the regional administrator for EPA that will cover um, not only Texas, but Louisiana, Oklahoma, New Mexico. And it's a large bureaucracy that she will have to contend with. Um, we have great appointees at high levels of government, but these are vast bureaucracies that are, um, that are difficult to manage, that have their own agendas, and they know that they can wait out uh, a Republican Congress and they can wait out a Republican president. So we have to be vigilant with legislative with this short time frame that we have whether it's Endangered Species Act, WOTUS, and our land management rubric, uh, but we're also gonna have to work with you in the future to fight back on the Golden Sheep Warbler. That's a big case that we're working on here in Texas. So um, the, the, the fight doesn't end just because we win, we win the White House. And General Paxson, one of the signature uh, feats of your tenure in office was the coalitions you led in fighting the Obama administration. But now I see the press releases about the number of amicus briefs and other ways that your office is now supporting the current administration. Would you discuss that shift and how you see a different role maybe now with uh, the current, current president? So it's interesting that um, the, the Democrats quickly adopted our, st our strategy. And so you saw very quickly on the travel ban that there were 18 Democratic Attorney generals that filed out in the Ninth Circuit, first in Washington, then in Hawaii. And so when it got to the Ninth Circuit, we noticed that really the law wasn't being focused on. They were, these courts were creating new constitutional rights for non-citizen aliens. And so we saw the opportunity to step up and say, look, court, look at the law. At least have, we wanted them to have the opportunity to see what the law was, and if they made a wrong decision, at least we would have the record built for the U.S. Supreme Court. And so. That was sort of the beginning. We stepped out alone on that one. No one really wanted to get involved initially. None of the other states did. As a matter of fact, I went on a, a show, uh, MSNBC, on a Sunday night. And the reason I went on Sunday night is I knew none of you were watching. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of like free practice. Um, and I remember when I got on there, uh, I was sitting in a studio in Dallas, and I had the you know, earbud in, and I was looking into a camera. It was dark. And I was interviewing with this uh, lawyer uh, on MSNBC, and he, the first thing they did was play a clip from the Washington State AG, and this was their first attempt on the travel ban, this group of AGs, and the AG from Washington, the clip was talking about how, you know, Texas is crazy, they're just out here by themselves, no one else is joining them, and so when he came back to me, this guy's name was Ari, and he said, well, don't you feel like, you know, you're, 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 you're it's just Texas, don't you feel all alone uh, following this amicus brief uh, by yourselves, and I said, I said, look, Ari, I'm from a state of 28 million people. I'm never alone. <laughs> so thank you for standing with me. <laughs> well, and, and just to come back uh, briefly, General Paxton, maybe a little bit deeper dive, but the argument is there of, look, when Obama was president, Texas sued the Obama administration, and so now that Trump is president, liberal states like California and New York, they're doing the same thing. So, you know, it's, you know, it's good for the goose, good for the gander, apples to apples comparison. I don't agree, but I'd like to get your that's thoughts. A, so that's a great point, and that's certainly what you hear in the media, but the, the, it's very different. So we would sue the Obama administration because they were stepping outside of their constitutional authority. 
They were making law at the executive branch level. They were stealing power from Congress. Congress was allowing it to happen. On the other side, the courts were deferring through something called Chevron deference, where these agencies were getting deference when they shouldn't, they shouldn't be getting that deference. And so the system was breaking down. And, and then the states were beginning to lose their power. And so we were challenging based on this whole idea that separation of powers really does matter, that the Constitution really does matter, and the President can't make law. That was our argument. The difference for the Democrats and for the, for the liberals is that they're now doing the very same thing. They're, going, they're, they're, they're using our strategy, but they're going to court asking the court to basically undo what a legislature's done or what the President has lawfully done. And so they're, they're making up new ideas, new law. And so the difference is we were challenging based on constitutional principles because we didn't, we didn't think the president had the authority to make law. They're now going to the courts and asking those courts to do what the president was doing before. And so it's a very different, even though they're sort of copying us, it's a very different theory under which they're going versus what we did. Commissioner, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I think that their pieces of litigation seek to empower government rather than empowering the individual. And um, yes, it is a mechanism, but this is their only mechanism by which they have since we have legislative and executive control, but um, in terms of what we encounter at the land office, we are still, I, I foresee that if I'm privileged to serve you for another four years, we'll be in the courthouse dealing with Obama executive overreach on waters of the U.S. Um, if you talk to farmers and ranchers throughout the state of Texas, that's, that's the biggest issue. This is a subterfuge by which the federal government can make claim to title on riverbeds, lakes, estuaries um, under the Clean Water Act. And so, Executive um, impact from the Obama administration will have a long-lasting, um, a long-lasting impact that will require litigation or a legislative fix, and so, um, so that's what would be will be consumed with in our in our framework of land management issues. Would you speak to with this current administration uh, specifically with all of the, the the mineral rights that your office manages and certainly the. the the deregulation of the EPA that has allowed, you know, taking the, the foot off of the throat of oil and gas, uh, but in other ways, ways that your agency has interacted with the new administration and where you see the opportunities that are going to benefit, benefit Texas from the cooperation that you now have with, with Washington. Well, Secretary Pruitt, for the record, has been a breath of fresh air for for Texas. Um, he has allowed the energy industry to, uh, to proliferate where half of our country's production is uh, housed in, in West Texas. And that will power our country's future towards true energy independence. Um, the, the work of uh, the EPA under Secretary Pruitt will allow our agency to generate record amounts of revenue. We reported uh, two billion in revenue for school children uh, despite the correction in, in price of oil and gas, but with regulatory relief, you'll be able to see producers um, take, take risk. And, and entrepreneurial venturing is what uh, makes our state so great and will um, allow for um, ingenuity to continue in West Texas. Not to mention to take advantage of the exporting opportunity because of Congress work um, just a few years ago to now be a net exporter in the foreseeable future of both the oil and gas was something that was laughable when you and I were in law school, um, when, when they got rid of the energy law question on, on uh, the Barbary exam. This is an exciting opportunity, and thanks to the Trump administration, we're, um, we're going to move forward on it. That's right. I, I remember at that time, not really that long ago, you know, the headlines about we're running out, you know, America is going dry, and that's certainly not the case. General Paxton, I want to get your thoughts. I was asked yesterday in the Dallas Morning News on the cost that's been incurred in resources and staff time in, in fighting the past administration and during and, and defending the current administration, my response was this is part of the job. This is the role of Texas and it is just one of the many functions with which you're tasked to do, both of you gentlemen with your office. But how do you see this and, and the continued need fitting within the scope of the Attorney General's office? So, I mean, it's a great question. We get asked all the time about costs. You think about just one example, the Clean Power Plan, which Texas and West Virginia led the way on. Uh, we had 24 states involved. The projected cost of these regulations that showed no particular benefit to our country on clean air was about 29 to 39 billion a year. And so whatever we had to spend to 
stop that from occurring was well worth um, what we spent based on what it was going to cost the state in jobs, in uh, less reliable uh, delivery of electricity, and then just the incredible cost that was going to be uh, put on our consumers. And then my second answer to that question of Dallas Morning is, which I don't know that they would understand, is that, um, I'm sorry, did I say that? Um, was um, there's no, what, what price do you put on liberty? What price do you put on the Constitution? I mean, my job is to defend law, defend the Constitution, and when you have a federal government that disdains the Constitution, and we are the biggest Republican state with the most resources, with the greatest talent, we were best able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with DOJ, and we proved it over and over, between Governor Abbott and, and my office, 58 lawsuits in basically six years. Uh, we went toe-to-toe -to -toe and we won. And, and so what price do you put on that? So the Dallas Morning News can question the cost, but when we're defending the Constitution, you know, it, it, what's, the, what's the price for that? And I don't think we can put a price tag on that. General Passon, that makes another great point. And, and to come back to you, Commissioner Bush, we're not always going to agree with Washington, D.C., even with a Republican administration. Yeah. And <laughs> so looking forward also in, in the need to be vigilant in looking at defending Texas state sovereignty, uh, I want to ask you to, to explain uh, your office's role in delisting the Golden Cheek Warbler, but also how we have just spoken about working with this administration, um, but where there may be times when we won't, or we need to be uh, raising a voice on behalf of Texas, and would love to get your thoughts. With respect to endangered species, this is a looming threat that we see on state lands and private lands here in Texas. There, are, um, under, under the endangered uh, Species Act, since its um, passage through U.S. Congress, less than 2% of species that have been listed have been delisted. Um, the intent of the law has been misconstrued. What we should do is celebrate the success of delisting species and using science to confirm that. And so through our uh, litigation, our, our venture uh, on the Golden Cheek Warbler, we intend to do exactly that. Uh, there have been four studies by a &M that show that the species is proliferating uh, in the I-35 corridor. Uh, the state has standing, so again, we manage 13 million acres combined surface and mineral rights, so we, we are, I think, uh, we have pretty good standing throughout the state, and we have great beneficiaries. They're your kids uh, in public schools. But what's very alarming about this case is that it could affect national security and military readiness. Um, we hired the garrison commander from Fort Hood, the largest military installation in North America, and he saw this as a looming threat that because of the potential listing of the Golden Cheek Warbler, a third of Fort Hood would be um, obstructed for use for mechanized infantry for preparing our boys and girls for combat downrange. Uh, so when we're talking about the Endangered Species Act, how it's been abused, uh, we think that this is another case where um, we can get involved. We think that under sue and settle, that over 100 potential species are, are being pursued by plaintiff's attorneys, not from Texas, but from other, other parts of the country, um, either trying to shut down the oil and gas industry, shut down our military bases, and, and essentially politicize the use of the act. So um, we'll, we'll likely be active in the courthouse on, on, uh, under the Endangered Species Act as well. General. <laughs> General Paxson, your, your work has not ended in terms of opportunities to, to sue the administrative state in Washington, D.C. You had a great win last week over the EEOC rule, uh, and your office has filed several lawsuits this year uh, over the Clean Air Act and other issues. Would you speak to some of those ongoing efforts that you're leading? So a lot of this is leftover Obama administration activity that the Trump administration hasn't gotten to, and so sometimes we just have to bring some attention to it, and so we do. <laughs> and uh, I, I think one of my most interesting ones, and I, I've got two kind of interesting ones, one was uh, related to Yucca Mountain. The state of Texas has put in, uh, I think, over a billion dollars. Other states have put in a lot of money to build this nuclear waste site, and it has never been built. And so we were asking for um, them to either, Congress to either get it done, 
Department of Energy to get it done or give us our money back. I don't, I don't think that's that unreasonable. And so, um, of course, we have a new Secretary of Energy. And uh, <laughs> I've heard of him. <laughs> you know, I, I might have gotten a call from him um, when he, he heard rumors that we might sue um, the Department of Energy. And, it, and he didn't like the sound of Texas v. Perry. Um, <laughs> so I said, uh, I said, well, Governor, you know, if you can get us our 1.5 billion in the next couple of weeks, I promise I won't see you. <laughs> um, he kind of gulped, and I didn't hear back. So uh, we filed that lawsuit, and uh, I put his name further down, so it's kind of hidden. But <laughs> you know, um, I said, Governor, the truth is, if if you were governor of Texas, I know exactly what you'd tell me. So we sued. Second one was uh, a very sort of controversial issue, but my, my job is not to worry about controversial issues. My job is to enforce the law, to focus on defending the Constitution. And so we had been successful in the immigration case where, the, where we took it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and we had the 26 states, and we got an injunction stopping DAPA, uh, Deferred Action for, for Parent Arrivals. Um, and we won on the law, we won on the Constitution. And so we had DACA left over, which Obviously, more sympathetic case for children that came here, not necessarily by their choice. And, but the problem was, it was the same method of putting it in place. The President of the United States made up law, changed the law. And so we were trying to get that changed as well. And so we sent a letter with ten, uh, nine other AGs to the President in, I think it was end of June, beginning of July. And we said, we're going to give you till September 5th to rescind this, or we're going to amend our complaint, we're going to go back and sue you. All the legal scholars we're pretty confident we'd win because we'd won on DAPA and it was exactly the same argument that the President of the United States can't just change the law on immigration. And so we gave them a September 5th deadline. And on September 5th, uh, to, to their credit, Jeff Sessions came out and said, we are gonna give Congress time and it's certainly up to Congress to make that decision. We're gonna give them six months till March 5th and if they do not act, we're gonna rescind this. That's the way the process is supposed to work. And so we haven't backed down, whether it was uh, you know, President Obama or President Trump, if we see things that are harmful to Texas or harmful to the Constitution, we're not gonna be afraid to interject ourselves. The difference with the Trump administration is that they actually return our phone calls. And so, <laughs> and so we can actually communicate and try to work things out in a more, uh, I'd say, a better way for not just Texas, but the entire nation. So it's been a pleasure working with Scott Pruitt at the EPA and, you know, Rick Perry at the Department of Energy and just the entire gamut of good people that the Trump, Trump administration put in place. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> you did mention explain your leadership in the, the Golden Cheek Warbler matter, but you only gave passing reference to the WOTUS issue, the waters of the United States. And I wanted to, to ask, if you would explain a little bit more your involvement and how that fight continues. So essentially, uh, the Obama administration um, expanded or implemented um, a rule uh, called the Waters of the U.S. Um, that essentially allowed for the EPA to intervene on behalf of the administration and, and actually claim jurisdiction over uh, submerged lands throughout the United States of America, including riverbeds, lakes, and estuaries. And, the acreage involved in that decision, it amounts to, um, to hundreds of thousands of acres. So it's, it's more meaningful and impactful than it perhaps sounds. In the agriculture community, this is probably the last item to check off. I happen to be partnered with the Western States Land Commissioner Association, where we do file a lot of amicus uh, briefs together. And this is really our top priority with uh, the Trump administration. One of his first acts was to sign an executive order that ordered um, Secretary Pruitt to, to re-examine it, uh, include, including rescinding the rule. So we're, we're hoping either for a legislative fix or a complete um, withdrawal um, from, from the rule itself. And so we're, we're watching vigilantly that, um, that fix. That's, that's a big issue that would have impact on Texas because like I said, less than 1% of the state's geography is controlled by the feds. There are different mechanisms by which our opponents are trying to claim more ownership in Texas. We have a proud record. Utah, Nevada, um, some of my counterparts in this organization have over 70% of their state's geography controlled by the feds. Wow. And um, th this is one of the biggest mechanisms that, um, that is being used along with the Antiquities Act, the monument designation, the Bears Ears uh, monument that you may have heard about in Utah. 
Um, but we have to be vigilant, and uh, WOTUS is, is a big piece of it. General, General Paxton, we, we, we did mention sue and settle, uh, but there have been instances where you have filed suit and the federal government has agreed, and that is different from the, the practice that's been rejected by the administration. To what extent can your office help this administration through litigation by highlighting issues and areas of reform that maybe we don't have to take all the way to trial, uh, but can still make you know, a better life for Americans? So yeah, I'll give you an example. So I would think it was just a couple of days after Scott Pruitt had been confirmed as the EPA administrator. And of course, Scott Pruitt was the Oklahoma AG, and he might have been involved in 12 of our lawsuits against the EPA before he moved to the EPA. <laughs> so we had this issue with the uh, oil and gas industry where they were putting these unreasonable regulations that really accomplished nothing good on, on, on the oil and gas industry. So I went and met with him in DC got to see his new office, which is about the size of this room. Um, <laughs> and I, it was kind of interesting, first of all, talking to him, I said, you know, how's it going? He goes, well, it's great to be at a place where 15,000 people hate me. Um, <laughs> but I delivered a letter to him from 10 other AGs and, and myself that we, we drafted, asking them to remove these regulations that were gonna hurt the oil and gas industry with no benefit to, to the country, no benefit on anything that we could see. And so, Unlike what we would normally have had to do, which was file a lawsuit and go through years of litigation and then win, um, we submitted that letter, and the next day he rescinded the regulations. 24 hours. So that's the difference between the Obama administration and the Trump administration, if you need one. You need an example. <laughs> Here in, uh, in closing, uh, and this has been a great discussion, thank you, thank you both gentlemen for, for your leadership to Texas and, and for sharing your accomplishments with this room here today. But I wanna ask each of you, and, and to start with you, Commissioner Bush, to, to give your vision for, for hope and optimism moving forward with what you're doing and with where you see uh, that Texas is going and the opportunities uh, that lie ahead. Well, I think Texas can continue to lead in land management. Um, I, I really, I think, measure our performance based upon my counterparts in the Western States Land Commissioners Association. Um, there are 23 members. We manage over 550 million acres, which is, to put it into context, the geographic size of Alaska, Texas, uh, and Hawaii. Uh, it's a large swath of land, and it's all constitutionally protected to benefit uh, school children in our respective jurisdictions. If you look at where we stand versus every other state, we are head and shoulders uh, above the rest of our, of our competition. Um, and we truly are a leader as a state. And um, I, I just, I'm privileged to serve in this role. Uh, I wanna continue that. I think we can be a vanguard. Um, we have to take advantage of this short period of time that we have with control of the Congress and uh, the White House. Um, so we have to be vigilant. We have a great attorney general that's been an incredible partner uh, an organization like this that is truly a lifeblood for, um, for conservative philosophy uh, and will continue to be. So um, consider me a teammate of yours, a partner, and I look forward to the future fights to come. Thank you. General Paxson, to close, uh, TPPF alumni Don Willett is a uh, plug for TPPF, is on the Fifth Circuit. AG alumni, too. AG alumni. Former Solicitor General Jim Ho has joined him. Of course, you mentioned former Justice. Former AG office, too. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Future looks good. And from being the, the lead attorney for the state of Texas, what is your hope and optimism looking forward? So I'm not trying to exaggerate or use hyperbole. I don't think that the Constitution, that the nation survives without Texas. I think it would already be over from the election of Donald Trump, because if Texas is not here, we don't elect Donald Trump. The fight that we've had for the last eight years to protect liberty would not have happened but for Texas. The other states don't have the resources, they don't have the talent to do it themselves, and maybe not even the desire, but they look to us to lead. And so I'm optimistic because Texas has made that difference. We've continued to make that difference. 
And I believe that we will continue to make that difference. And we, you know, that's why this group, that's why you all individually and as a group, leveraging your resources and your, your talents to push forward the agenda that we care about. It really it matters more than I think we sometimes realize. We would not have these freedoms but for Texas and the last eight years of our fight. And so if we ever get tired, if we ever grow weary, if we ever say, I've, I've had enough, it, it goes away. And so I'm optimistic because I know Texas. I, I moved here when I was 18 by choice. And I moved here because of people like you, because I wanted to be around people that cared about the things that I cared about. And so I, I just want to say thank you because it, it is everything. It is, we are, we are the hope for America. And that's not an exaggeration. It is, I think, factually true that but for Texas and our efforts leading the nation, we would have already lost. So we are continuing to battle. We've got six or seven lawsuits right now that have challenged legislative action from voter ID to redistricting to uh, Planned Parenthood defunding, you name it, sanctuary cities. It's the same battle. Go to a liberal judge, they pick the venue, they file a lawsuit, they win, and we have to take it up. And so far, every one of those cases, we've lost at district court, and we've won at the Fifth Circuit of the U.S. Supreme Court. They're not going to stop. We're not going to stop. The difference is we're going to win. Yeah. So the fight continues, led by these amazing men and patriots. And please help me in thanking and uh, thank you for your service. General Paxton, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, Texas General Land Office Commissioner George P. Bush. Thank you both. Thank you all. General, General Paxton, Commissioner Bush, Rob Henneke, thank you. You have some panels that are starting immediately, so if you don't mind making your way to there, great, and you will not want to miss lunch. Have a great morning.